Thank you very much, John, and uh, thank you all for coming out tonight. Uh, really honored and gratified to be able to be here tonight. Uh, I didn't write this book uh, as a tell-all about the health insurance industry or, or really my role in it. Uh, the ultimate message is that we need to be mindful of what is happening to our democracy, and I will talk about that a bit more in just a few minutes. But uh, uh, I wrote this book primarily because of my concerns about uh, what is happening to our democracy and uh, what we need to do if we have any expectation of salvaging it and keeping us from really becoming a plutocracy if we're not already there. Uh, I've been speaking a lot. I've, I've uh, been, I guess you would say, an advocate for reform or a, uh, someone who's not spending for the insurance industry just for a little over a year now, about a year and a half. Uh, I have been speaking at a lot of forums, and I'm almost always asked, uh, why, did, why did I do this? Why, why did you do this, Wendell Potter? And um, why did you feel compelled to walk away from a good paying job? And others ask, um, why don't more people do what you did? Um, and still others are not willing to give me much slack at all. I spoke at Johns Hopkins University a couple of weeks ago, and I got an email from a woman who was in the audience, and uh, I was explaining to her some of the things that led to my decision to walk away from my job, and she either wasn't listening or wasn't really persuaded that I was an honorable person. She said, really, Mr. Potter? It wasn't until 2008 that you realized that uh, there were people in this country who deserved to receive, to, to receive medical care and weren't getting it. 2008, while you spent 30 years spending for health insurance companies and defeating health care reform, people died. May your God be a merciful one. Um, so I get all kinds of mail, <laughs> uh, and some not so kind. Uh, I'm going to read just a little bit from the book. I don't want this to be just me standing up here reading because uh, I want us to have a conversation and I want you to ask me whatever is on your mind so that we can just have a, a real give and take. But I think I need to give you some context about who I am and uh, maybe what led me to do what I did decide to do and maybe what maybe some of the circumstances were unique for me that led me to, uh, to walk away from that job. To explain why I decided to go public as a critic of the health insurance industry, I need to explain where I came from. I was born in Banner Elk, North Carolina on July 16, 1951, not because my parents lived there, but because they didn't have access to affordable quality care, uh, as we sometimes call it in this, uh, this age, in the tiny town where they did live, uh, on the other side of the Blue Ridge Mountains, Mountain City, Tennessee. There was no hospital in Mountain City or the entire county for that matter. My parents, Blaine and Pearl Potter, were born and raised in Johnson County. Mountain City is the county seat, one of the most beautiful places on earth in my opinion, uh, but where even today it's hard to make a living. There were only two doctors in all of Johnson County when I was born. My mother didn't want either of them, either of them to have anything to do with bringing me into the world, so she had heard good things about the hospital in Banner Elk so that's where dad drove her over 30 miles of winding mountainous roads when she went into labor. Affordable quality health care wasn't the only thing my folks didn't have easy access to. Money was another. I've never met a smarter, harder working, and more resourceful man than my dad, but I probably earned more in one year at Cigna than he earned in 20 some years that he worked in a brutally hot factory before he retired in 1980. Before his factory job, when I was born, he and mom had a small farm. The main money crop was tobacco, and they ran a little country store, Potter's Grocery, on Spear Branch Road in Mountain City. Dad built both the store and our first house with a little help from some of my uncles and cousins. Like most of the houses on Spear Branch Road, at that time, ours did not have an indoor bathroom. Uh, we would not have one, in fact, until we moved when I was six to what seems, seemed to me to be a huge city, Kingsport, Tennessee, about 50 miles to the west. For more than a year before we moved to Kingsport, Dad commuted to the Blue Ridge Glass Plant, uh, where a relative had been able to get him a job while Mom tended the store. 
Sometimes dad was so tired after working a double shift that he would sleep in the back of his 1949 Willis Jeep wagon rather than risk driving home exhausted all the way back to Mountain City. I didn't see a lot of him during that time. When Potter's Grocery became a money loser, uh, they had to close it and look for another way to support us. It seems that mom and dad had let a lot of their out-of-work customers, all of whom were neighbors and many of them whom were our relatives, run up tabs that they could never pay off. After that, we lived in a duplex close to the glass plant until mom and dad had saved enough money to make a down payment on a rundown house a few miles outside of town that dad would spend months fixing up. Dad never knew much about his own father. One day when dad was in the third grade, his father walked away and never came back, leaving my grandmother to raise nine children herself. They all had to get odd jobs to help put food on the table. When he was in his early 20s, dad joined the Civilian Conservation Corps, a Great Depression era work program created during the Roosevelt administration. The CCC put him on a train and sent him across the country to help build a public works project in Doty, Washington. He mailed almost everything he made back home to his mother, as he did later when the Army sent him to Europe and North Africa during World War II. Mom and Dad were introduced by my dad's older sister, Frances, and my mom's older brother, Otho, when, who were married in the in mid-1930s. Mom and Dad dated for years before the war, but decided not to get married until Dad returned, they hoped, uh, from his tour of duty. While Dad was overseas, Mom got a wartime job working at an assembly, uh, on an assembly line at a chemical plant in Kingsport. They were married a few days after Dad got back home. I didn't arrive for another six years. Neither of my parents was able to finish high school, having to work instead. They wanted nothing more for me than to have an easier life than they had had, and they knew I would, wouldn't have a chance unless I had a good education. They sacrificed years to save enough money to send me to college. I'll never be able to repay them or thank them enough. I became the first person in my family to earn a college degree when I graduated from the University of Tennessee in 1973. That's the first time, first time I've read that aloud, and the reason I'm doing it tonight is because uh, I got word earlier today that my dad is gravely ill. Uh, he's 93, he had a, has had a wonderful life. He had a stroke um, soon after his 90th birthday. And um, uh, that weakened him, and his, his health has just steadily declined. So I'm going to be leaving here tomorrow morning and uh, flying back to Tennessee to be with him and mom. And you know, I, maybe, the, maybe I'm going back there to say goodbye to my dad. So I read that really just as an honor to my father more than anything else, and we can talk about other things. But you may have heard, uh, maybe you haven't, uh, that I really made a decision that I was in the wrong line of work when I went back to visit mom and dad uh, in 2007, just before dad's 90th birthday. Uh, I had, uh, had really traveled a lot, uh, very far from Spear Branch Road, and Harvard Square certainly is very far from Spear Branch Road in Mountain City, Tennessee. Uh, I had a wonderful career, first two careers actually. I was a journalist, uh, a newspaper reporter in Memphis and Nashville and ultimately in Washington. I covered Congress and the White House and the Supreme Court. Um, I left that job to get into PR because it paid better. And, uh, and it does pay quite a lot better. A lot of reporters leave journalism to get into PR because of that. And a lot of them now are leaving because their jobs as journalists are are ending. Uh, newsrooms are shrinking and uh, a lot of uh, newspapers are folding. So there are far fewer journalists now than there were when I joined it, but a lot more PR people. Uh, that's one reason I'm, I'm worried about our democracy. Um, but uh, I had a wonderful career in PR as well, and I wound up uh, working for two of the largest health insurance companies in, in America, Humana and then Cigna, for all together for about 20 years. Uh, rising to be the uh, head of corporate communications at Cigna, and I had had a similar job at Humana. As part of that job, I uh, handled financial communications for the company. I had to know how the company made money. Um, actually, for the first four years of my job at Cigna, I worked in and supported the healthcare division. Cigna at that time was a big multi-line insurance company, had a lot of divis divisions, but I was hired specifically to help uh, raise the awareness of the healthcare division and Cigna as a healthcare company. 
So I got to know a lot of the people who ran the healthcare business. A few years later, I was asked to move to Philadelphia where the corporate offices are, and I ultimately became head of corporate communications. And I was the person who, among other things, was on the phone uh, once every three months when the company announced earnings to explain to financial reporters how the company made money, how it met Wall Street's expectations, how it uh, 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 made the medical loss ratio that the investors wanted, how it made the earnings per share. To be able to answer those questions, I obviously had to know a lot about the healthcare industry and about my own company. I knew, obviously, also that there were 47 million people at that time who didn't have insurance. Uh, I knew that a growing number of people were underinsured. Uh, but I dealt in numbers primarily. I dealt in the millions of dollars, the billions of dollars that the company earned in revenues and the millions of dollars that it earned in profits. Uh, I knew how many million members that Cigna had at any given time. Uh, I also represented the company at a lot of trade association meetings in Washington, and I had done that from almost the beginning of my career at Cigna. I spent a lot of time working uh, with my peers in the industry at the trade association level for what is now America's health insurance plans, developing PR strategies to um, make sure that whenever health care reform was being debated in any form or fashion in Washington or the state capitals, that we as an industry would try to influence how that legislation took shape and if we didn't like it, to kill it. Uh, I played a role in killing the Clinton plan. Uh, the insurance industry did not like it, and a lot of people didn't like the, the Clinton plan in the, in, in the health care business. Uh, but I uh, played a role in the public relations strategy to make sure that people were frightened of the Clinton plan. You might have heard uh, or remember the Harry and Louise commercials of that era. Uh, they were sponsored by health insurance companies, and you paid for them with your health care premiums if you were privately insured at that time. Um, most people don't realize that a big chunk of their premiums go to pay for lobbying and for PR and advertising activities, often uh, spent specifically to undermine health care reform, as that was back then. But during that time, I frankly was still a believer in the private market and, and, and its role in our health care system, and in particular, managed care as a concept. I felt that it really was something that could could really bring more people into coverage and be a good way for people to get the care that they needed. So I was a, an HMO promoter for a long time. Uh, there was a big backlash against the HMOs, as you may remember, in the 90s and early part of the 2000s, and I was the person who was on the front lines answering calls from reporters about, as we call them, horror stories, when someone was denied coverage for something and was gravely ill uh, and needing a transplant, for example. I was really quite happy with my job. I, as I said, I made a lot more money than my dad ever made in a year's time. But I went back to visit mom and dad in July of 2007, and I picked up my hometown newspaper, and I read about a health care expedition that was being held uh, just up the road, 50 miles, in Wise County, Virginia. Uh, keep in mind, uh, East Tennessee, this part of Tennessee is in the southern Appalachians. It's just right across the state line from southwestern Virginia, where um, a lot of coal mines. Uh, there's a lot of poverty in that, that region, but there are a lot of people who work at uh, uh, jobs that don't pay them a heck of a lot of money, for a lot of, and they work in a lot of small businesses, and a lot of them still work in the coal mines if, if they can get jobs there. Uh, the newspaper story said that people would be driving probably from four and 500 miles away to come to this healthcare expedition. I'd never heard of it before, but this was the eighth year it was being held, and it was being put on by this organization called Remote Area Medical. Uh, and I read that that was an, an outfit that was uh, organized uh, to fly doctors from the U.S. to the Amazon and to Africa uh, to provide care to people in, in those remote locations who didn't have access to care at all. Um, I've, I've read that the organizers pretty quickly realized, though, that uh, there's a great need in this country that's not being met because so many people are uninsured and underinsured. Out of curiosity, I decided to borrow my dad's car and drive up there. I thought maybe it was just a kind of a glorified uh, health fair, and maybe they were doing blood pressure checks and things like that to, to help these folks out. Uh, I was not prepared at all for what I saw. It was being held at the Wise County Fairgrounds, and when I got there, it was about 8 o'clock in the morning. I left early to get there. 
uh, the parking lot was jam-packed full of cars, I, but I didn't see anyone milling around outside. Uh, it was very pretty tranquil outside, as a matter of fact, and it was not until I walked inside the fairground gates that it was, I, I was just so stunned with what I saw that I almost immediately realized that what I was doing for a living was what I was not supposed to be doing, and that pretty soon I was going to have to be making a change if I was to listen to my own conscience. Uh, I saw hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people who were lined up, uh, and they had been there for hours, just like my dad had spent many nights in the back of his 1949 Willis Jeep wagon. Uh, these folks had driven and had spent the night in their cars, many of them, or in the back of their pickup trucks, uh, waiting to be able so they can get in line uh, and be able to get a number at 5 o'clock in the morning um, so that when the fairgrounds, fairground gates were opened at 6, they would have some assurance, hopefully, of being able to see a doctor or a nurse or an optometrist or uh, a dentist. Uh, and they had been standing in long lines for, for more than an hour just before the gates opened. By the time I got there, many of them had been standing in long lines for hours waiting to get care that was being provided, as I realized pretty quickly, in animal stalls and barns on the fairground, in that, that fairground. Uh, and I, I found out, too, that most of those folks had jobs. They were not people who uh, were unemployed. Uh, they just were working for companies that did not offer health care benefits. One thing that I became very much aware of in my job is that one of the things that insurance companies do to make sure that they're meeting Wall Street's expectations is get rid of risk. They don't like risk. Uh, they, they have been engaging many of them in this practice called rescission in which when someone gets sick, uh, the insurance company will take a look at the application they filled out uh, and, and looking for the possibility that someone might have erred or have in, uh, intentionally uh, misled or, or failed to report a pre-existing condition. They do that. Some, some companies have paid bonuses to employees looking uh, at applications so that they can cancel someone's coverage. There was a woman who testified before Congress about the same time I did who said that uh, while she was in the midst of being treated for breast cancer, she got a letter from her insurance company that said uh, she, her insurance was being canceled. Uh, she thought she had been honest on her application. Uh, she found out later that she, she was being, uh, her insurance was being canceled because she had forgotten to report that she had been treated for acne in the recent past. So she was being left to pay all of her expenses, all of her cancer care, uh, on her own. Um, at least her insurance company was refunding the payments that she had been making, uh, but that wasn't nearly enough to pay for her cancer care. This goes on all the time. Uh, th there's a congressional investigation into just three insurance companies that found that those three over uh, uh, five years had rescinded 20,000 policies. That may not sound like a whole lot until you look at how much money those companies avoided paying out in claims, over $300 million. So they look for the, the big ticket items. They look for the, 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 the people who are really sick and who are, who's, you know, they're, they're incurring a lot of claims. Another way that they uh, get rid of people they don't want to insure is to jack up the rates of small businesses when those businesses come up for renewal if an employee of a small business gets sick during the year. Uh, underwriters uh, uh, sometimes uh, underestimate or, or can't predict exactly when someone's going to get sick, obviously. So uh, uh, if the, the experience of the group is more than underwriters expected, uh, that small business can expect that the rates will increase significantly when the business comes up for renewal. And that's one of the reasons why uh, since 1993 we've seen this incredible decline in the number of small businesses that offer benefits to their employees. And that was the situation in Wise County. Uh, those folks worked for businesses, but those, their employers, for one reason or another, could not offer benefits or didn't, or they just simply weren't able to, to afford to pay the premiums even if they were subsidized by their employers. I found out also later that a lot of those folks do have insurance, but they are in plans that now have such high deductibles or such limited benefits that they uh, had no alternative but to wait till once a year to stand in these long lines to get care that's being provided free. Yes, they're paying premiums every year, every, every month, but the, the value of that is, is less and less. Uh, and that was one of the reasons I decided to leave. I knew some of these practices from firsthand experience, but I also um, 
uh, was aware that the benefit plans that the insurance industry is wanting to, and it is moving us toward, are these high deductible plans. They call them consumer driven plans. But the, the reality is that uh, many of us are unable to meet the deductibles. So a lot of us are foregoing care even when we have insurance. We can't afford to pay our deductibles. So that's why a lot of those folks were there. I knew when I saw that, that a lot of those people could have been people I could have grown up with. They could have been people who lived down the road in Spear Branch Road in Mountain City, Tennessee. A lot of them were relatives, uh, could have been relatives who lived in South Carolina, or people obviously I've never met, uh, uh, but they were people who needed care, but for whatever reason, in the United States of America, they could not get it. They had to come once a year to get care in barns. Um, I probably would not have been so affected by that had it not been for my own upbringing and uh, just uh, you know, coming up the way I was brought up and, and, and knowing those people. Uh, and also my job as a journalist in my first career. I, as a journalist, was so proud of the fact that I felt that I was trying to tell the truth, uh, to find the truth and report it, and to be as objective as I possibly could. No reporter is entirely objective. You can't be. We're all human beings. But I tried to make sure that I was providing uh, as much information that was pertinent so that people could be informed. What I realized toward the end of my career was that I was uh, doing often just the exact opposite of what I was doing as a reporter. I was seeking to hide information or sometimes purposely mislead reporters uh, by not disclosing fully what should have been disclosed in response to a question. Uh, so I was part of, I came to realize, uh, a real propaganda machine uh, that was in operation and I was just a big part, I was a part of it. Uh, and I was perpetuating uh, a lot of the problems that we have in this country. In, in one chapter of this book, toward the beginning, I note that 45,000 people in this country die every year because they don't have health insurance. I'm sure a lot more people die as well because they're in these plans that they have to forego care. They, they, they stop going to the doctor or they stop taking their medications uh, when they you know, can no longer pay their deductibles. Uh, and I'm, I'm sorry to say that I am uh, a reason why some people have died. I have no doubt about it. So what I'm doing in, to a certain extent is, uh, if you will, making amends and trying to explain some of the things that I did when I worked in the industry. I don't have a, a, an ax to grind with Cigna. Uh, I was very well compensated there. I didn't have an ax to grind with anybody um, to the day I left. Uh, I uh, had many promotions and many bonuses and stock options. Uh, and I saw those stock options uh, go down when the medical loss ratio went down, by the way. I decided, though, that uh, one, thing, one thing else happened that made me just kind of uh, decide I can't keep doing this anymore. I, it was about this time three years ago, uh, in, in December, I got a call from a reporter in Los Angeles who said that um, uh, a 17-year-old girl was... Uh, needing a liver transplant, but Cigna had denied coverage for this transplant, and her parents were just incredulous. They knew that their policy covered transplants, but Cigna was saying no, and they wanted to know why. And there was some miscommunication, misunderstanding. They thought that the, the parents thought that they, they, they had found out that they owned some investment property or a second home, and that Cigna thought they could afford it on their own. Well, that wasn't the case. What really was the case was that um, even though her doctors in UCLA, UCLA in Los, in Los Angeles, said that she needed to have this transplant to survive. She had had leukemia in the past, uh, had been in remission, but it came back. Uh, they, her doctors said that they felt that she had a 65% chance of surviving five years if she had the transplant. Uh, Cygnus medical director, uh, a transplant specialist, presumably, 2,000 miles away in Pittsburgh, who had never met Natalie Sarkeesian, uh, decided that uh, uh, it was not medically appropriate, that in her case that, that transplant would have been experimental. So he denied coverage for it. And um, uh, the family was very resourceful, and I've seen that over the course of time. The squeaky wheel gets the grease, by the way. Uh, if you ever have a problem with your insurance company, be a squeaky wheel. Go to the media, go to your congressman, go to your state legislator, your, your insurance commissioner. Just raise hell and you'll become a high profile case and you will have a greater chance of getting some special attention. Well that happened 
And this family was able to generate not just local media coverage, but national and international coverage. I was, uh, again, on the front lines getting calls from reporters all over the world about this case. People were just absolutely outraged. Um, Cigna uh, eventually decided to pay for it. The, the pressure was that intense. And they communicated that uh, to the family just as the family was beginning a protest in front of Cigna's offices in Glendale, California. Uh, it was being covered live by CNN, and I was watching it as, a, as uh, someone whispered in Mrs. Sarkeesian's ear that Cigna had agreed to pay for it. She was overjoyed, you could see. And she, she, she and her husband hugged, and, and they were just really hopeful that this would save their daughter's life. I wish it had a happy ending. Um, so much time had passed that Natalene's health had deteriorated to the point that uh, uh, the transplant really would not work. Uh, and there was no liver available at that time anyway. She, uh, liver had been available early on, uh, but it had to be given to somebody else. Uh, and uh, uh, she died a few hours after the family got word that Cigna would finally pay for it. I was just heart sick. Uh, and and I, I just could not do another thing like that. I could not handle another high-profile case involving, um, involving something like this. It just was is too stressful for me. And I'm a father. I have a, a, a daughter who's not much older than Nataline. And I could just imagine what her parents were going through to a certain extent. I obviously can't. No one can until you're going through something like that. But I just didn't want to keep, I didn't want to do that again. So much had happened to me uh, during that year, and I had been able to see so much. The higher up the corporate ladder I got, the, the more I could see about what the industry really does and, and why it has caused so many of the problems that we have in this country in our health care system. So I turned in my resignation. And uh, uh, I'll stop there. We can, you can ask me some questions. Uh, I don't know what's on your mind, whether it might be about uh, what, what might be happening with health care reform now that it's passed, why I decided to ultimately start speaking out. Um, but my decision to leave was a hard one. I, I walked away from a good paying job without having plan B. Uh, I was not ready to retire. I was 55 years old. I, still, I, was, I was leaving my job at a time when I knew it was going to be hard for me to get a job. Uh, I have pre-existing conditions. I have high cholesterol, so I was worried about being able to get insurance in a crazy system here. But um, it was the most important thing I have done in my life was to walk away from that job. Maybe, I think the second most, the, probably the most important thing I've done was to get the courage to be able to, to try to explain what is going on in this country, why it is so hard for us to get real health care reform, what really is going on to help prevent it, and how big uh, corporations like the ones I work for and the others that are part of the health insurance system uh, have been able to keep it from happening. And not just the health insurers. Organized medicine, the AMA, has been very much a part of keeping reform from happening in years past. The drug companies have, have the medical device manufacturers have, uh, you, and the agents and brokers. There, there, there's a lot of blame to go around. This book kind of uh, was written to pull the curtains back so that people can see the things that, that happen to manipulate public opinion and also the practices that go on that result in now more than 50 million people not having insurance in this country and well over 25 million people being underinsured. We're all going to wind up there, folks, unless we're very careful and, and unless we can really make sure. This health care reform was not the end all, certainly not uh, be all and end all. Uh, and, it, and certain parts of it will likely be changed. And the health insurance industry is going to really do its best to change some of the consumer protections that it doesn't like. Uh, so one of the things I'm going to be doing going forward is return to my role as a journalist and watching over how it's implemented and writing about it and talking more about it. Um, that's enough for right now. I, I really want to have a conversation, and it can go wherever you want to take it. Thank you. You're listening to Cambridge Forum as we continue our discussion of deadly spin with health insurance watchdog Wendell Potter. How is corporate power undermining democracy? And uh, before I turn the, uh, the floor over uh, to the audience for questions, I'll exercise my moderator's prerogative and, sure. uh, and ask the first. You write a, a chapter in your book about Michael Moore's movie, Sicko, right. which was a, a documentary about the health care system and um, a, a, a very powerful and moving to many people documentary about the health care system and the campaign that health insurance 
uh, the health insurance industry uh, uh, launched to discredit him, right. uh, to demonize him, and to delegitimize what he was, uh, what he was um, uh, trying to communicate to the public. Two things. One, can you talk about that campaign a little bit and, and, and sort of the thinking behind it? And then the other question is, if people had, serious-minded people have had criticisms of Michael Moore's documentary, was there a responsible way that the health insurance industry could have gone about challenging that movie? Or was, uh, or was that never considered at all? Uh, no, it was never considered. Uh, to answer the second question, but uh, this was the, the movie uh, premiered in uh, in France at the Cannes uh, Film Festival in in uh, late May of 2007, and um, uh, he was he was very uh, Michael Moore uh, was very secretive about exactly what he was going to be portraying in the movie. Uh, we in the insurance industry were really concerned, obviously, that he would be coming after insurers. But there was reason to think that he might be going after pharmaceutical companies. Um, the, the big drug companies had actually uh, uh, sent memos to their employer to their employees, uh, warning them that Michael Moore might show up at the front front door at some point. So be on guard. Well, that was leaked to Michael Moore, and he uh, made a lot of hay out of that. So we in the in health insurance industry didn't want to. Um, Unwittingly, give him Michael Moore any uh, anything to, to 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 make hay with, or to, to have uh, any free publicity for his movie. At this time, uh, 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 we our pollsters were were telling us that uh, for the first time ever, more Americans were saying uh, that uh, a majority of Americans were saying that the government, the federal government in particular, need to play a more active role in our health care system. Uh, so the tide was really turning against. The, the market-based healthcare system, if you will, uh, because there were so many problems and, and the market was not working as the market said it would. It was not delivering on that promise. If you've got 47 million people uh, uninsured, something is not working right. Uh, and uh, the industry was very worried with the, about that statistic and they were very worried also about Michael Moore's movie. They were afraid that, that it would really uh, make matters worse, that it would galvanize people, that there would, a, a tipping point would be reached in which there would be an enormous outcry and backlash against the health insurance industry and uh, a great deal of uh, support for maybe even a single-payer system like Canada has. Uh, there, in Canada, it's, it is a single-payer system. There are no private insurance companies that operate like here, certainly no for-profit insurance companies. So the, 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 comp the, the companies felt that they had to do something to discredit the movie before it even come out, came out, or to be prepared for it. And uh, they knew that Michael Moore himself was a polarizing figure. His, his tactics in the past have been uh, well documented. He's uh, perceived as someone who's uh, quite a liberal and uh, uh, kind of a crazy kind of guy. And, and, and the industry wanted to depict him as someone who was kind of on, on the lunatic fringe, uh, someone who was out to undermine our democracy and our our way of life. Uh, that was job one. The other was to uh, discredit the notion that any other country was doing things better than we were. Uh, every other developed country in this, on the planet has been able to achieve universal coverage for its citizens in one way or another. Not all, other, they're not all doing the same thing, but they've been able to achieve something we have never been able to achieve. In fact, we're going in the opposite direction. More and more and more people are losing their coverage. Uh, so. We, we in the industry were very afraid that this movie would, would further erode uh, support for the so-called free market system, uh, and uh, it would endanger profits. So we set about uh, developing a, a, a very sophisticated and, and heavily resourced campaign to discredit the movie behind the scenes. What the industry would say and what I would say to the public was that, well, we welcome uh, this movie and, and Michael Moore's contribution to the debate. Uh, and, uh, and, and that was the, 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 what, what I call the, the charm offensive of the PR campaign. But what was really going on, the real work uh, was being done behind the scenes. We had hired a big PR firm called APCO Worldwide uh, to develop a very, very uh, sophisticated PR campaign, uh, one element of which was to set up a front group called Healthcare America. Uh, and, and it was uh, the sole reason for it to exist was to discredit uh, healthcare systems around the world and, and to discredit Michael Moore. 
and to scare people into thinking that something like we might see in Canada or, or the UK would represent a government takeover of the healthcare system, to use a term of art that they've created and want us all to believe. Uh, so uh, many th hundreds of thousands of dollars went into this campaign. Uh, Healthcare America uh, was launched and uh, uh, the media bought it. They thought this was truly a grassroots organization, but all along it was, uh, it was funded with money from the health insurance industry. Thanks to you, your premiums paid for it, uh, and from the drug companies. Uh, did the health insurance industry have to do this? Uh, yeah because you really, there's, you really can't justify the system that exists now. Part of what is going on here, there, uh, is a technique called reframing the debate. They wanted you to be afraid of Michael Moore and be afraid of a system like Canada has, to be afraid of more government involvement in your, in your health care system. They wanted you to be worried that a government bureaucrat would be coming between you and your doctor. When the reality is, in this country right now, uh, there's a good chance that there's a corporate bureaucrat like that doctor who uh, said no to Nadine's doctors. He, that doctor, that medical director, was just as much of a corporate employee as I was. And he knew just as much as I did that he had his role to play in making sure that the company met Wall Street's expectations. You're listening to Wendell Potter discussing Deadly Spin. Now let's take some questions from the audience. Please come forward and line up at the microphone. And please limit yourself to one well-phrased question in the form of a question to allow as many people as possible to speak. Yes, uh, I have a question which is, uh, not, uh, which is about corporations. I've read a lot about corporations, and we know they're not uh, democratic. They're not supposed to be, but they're not supposed to be antisocial either. And it is my impression from everything I've read that a corporation, I'm talking about large corporations, are usually controlled by a handful of men, probably three, particularly one. And I don't think people, I, I want to, it's to, uh, I'd like to ask you whether you can confirm to me who really controls, for example, the corporations, how many people really control the corporations you work for, and do you really know, and um, I'd appreciate your answer. Yeah, it is, it is a handful of people who really make the decisions, who call the shots. Uh, there's a CEO and his executive management team, and we're talking about maybe five, six, seven people. It depends on the corporation and the functions that report to, directly to the uh, CEO and how many, division, how many divisions are operating. Usually uh, the head of each division reports to the CEO. So we're talking about a, a, just a small number of people. Uh, Publicly traded companies have to uh, release a proxy to the SEC, and in that proxy, you you can see the the compensation for the, the at least the five most highly compensated uh, employees of a corporation, and you'll always see the CEO there, usually the chief financial officer. They are accountable to shareholders. There's a board of directors, of course, and so the CEO is accountable to the board of directors. But the they're truly an, uh, accountable to Wall Street. Uh, and the, 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 the large shareholders that own them. And we're not talking about your stock and my stock. You might own some stock in Cigna, and I might too. But uh, well over 85% of the stock in, in Cigna and most corporations are owned by big institutional investors. But may I comment that the, C, the people, the board of directors are usually appointed by the CEO and their friends of the director. And they uh, um, rely, uh, uh, they... He, he, um, uh, he, uh, he supplies them with their, their money, and the executives, they report to him, uh, and he has so much control. Mm -hmm. uh, Walt, and yes, he may report to Wall Street, but isn't it the CEO who's really controlling the company? There, um, there may be one or two directors. Apart from that, I don't think there's anyone. And these are large corporations, international, and with a large corporation, people are just numbers. It varies from corporation to corporation, but your premise is correct. The CEO is incredibly powerful, uh, wants to make sure, obviously, that he or she has a very good relationships with the board of directors and is able to influence who is on the board. Uh, and, uh, you know, sometimes they lose their jobs because they're not meeting the board's expectations or shareholders' expectations. The board is accountable to Wall Street, and, and sometimes that happens. Uh, but, and the, the CEO knows that, so uh, uh, the CEO needs to make sure that the board is happy.
listening to you speak this evening, I'm reminded of uh, my first encounter with uh, Dr. John Kitzhaber, uh, who put together a rather elegant scheme out in Oregon a number of years ago. Uh, your experience is relevant. Uh, you're extremely earnest and uh, a wonderful and plain speaker. I think those are very admirable things to do what it is you're doing. But I'm wondering what you think needs to change in Americans in order to move health care forward. It's not going to be something that happens overnight. We need to be less gullible. We need to be um, um, more mindful of how our opinions are shaped. Uh, and that really is the ultimate reason for writing this book. It's not because I had uh, a story to tell just about the health care reform debate, but to make sure people, or at least the folks who read this, understand uh, what goes into getting them to think and to act the way they do. Um, I uh, attended, as, uh, I was invited by a congressman to uh, speak at a town hall meeting in New Jersey uh, in September of 2009. And you probably read about and saw uh, the large crowds that were going to these town hall meetings, and, and many of them were being disrupted by, by, by people who were there, uh, not so much as to, to listen or ask questions as to disrupt. They were people who had been persuaded that health care reform, as, as it was working its way through Congress, was taking us on a slippery slope towards socialism, to use another term that uh, we've used for many years to scare people away from reform, uh, or that this represented a true government takeover of the health care system, or that, that this legislation created death panels, uh, or that it would put a government bureaucrat between someone and his doctor. This was, people were persuaded to go out and protest and disrupt because they had been persuaded to believe that and a lot of money went into that. There was a woman who came, to, I, I was explaining to this group, or trying to, it was, uh, it was hard to be heard over the, the din of all, uh, and the chaos that was going on, but I was trying to describe how this happens. Uh, and there was a woman, after it was over, who came up to me, uh, right like I was here, and she was at the, at the, at down below at the stage on, on the floor level. She said, no one paid me to be here. And I said, yes, ma'am, I know, no one paid you to be here. You didn't get a thin dime from anybody to get to come here today. But rest assured that a lot of money went into getting you here, to making you fearful enough and angry enough for you to come here and do what you've done today. And people are just are, are, are unaware of what goes on that leads them to think the way they do. The other thing that worries me is what is happening to our media. Uh, we're seeing the decline of mainstream media, uh, the almost disappearance of investigative reporting. I write about uh, how easy a job I had in dealing with reporters toward the end of my career. I would send them an email with a, a statement in response to their questions, and that would be it. I wouldn't have to talk to them if I didn't want to. I was a gatekeeper to the CEO. No one could talk to the CEO unless I said it was okay. Uh, and uh, it's going to take people just wisening up to what's going on and how their, uh, how their opinions are shaped, and also to what is happening to our democracy, that we're losing it. Uh, honest to God, we're losing it. Uh, our, uh, we are, are really, I think, more in a plutocracy in which uh, we, we're, we're seeing that the real shots are called by corporate executives and people with enormous, enormous wealth. So we, as a all of us have a role to play. If we, we can be influential folks. We can try to help, help people understand that. And uh, if we don't, we're screwed. If everyone is gullible and we have an enhanced democracy, an improved democracy, or maybe something like the good old days, I'm not sure what it is, yeah. um, where would we be in such a world? Well, we, if we had a good old democracy, we, I think we could... Our economy would be better. I mean, let me just go there for a moment. Um, uh, the, the current insurance system we have in this country is a huge albatross around the, necks of our, uh, around the neck of our economy. People don't realize this, but the special interests are so entrenched that we're able to... We're, this health care reform legislation, for example, uh, doesn't really reform our health care system. It, it helps to... It makes some things illegal that should have been made illegal before. It does bring more people into coverage. But it doesn't reform the system. 
it takes the system we've got uh, with private insurance companies operating, now dominated by for-profit companies, and tries to make them behave a little bit better with more regulation, but it doesn't offer real reform. Uh, and that's because they are so powerful they were able to keep any real reform from happening. A lot of people ask me, why was single payer never discussed in this country? And it's because they wouldn't allow it. The special interests would not allow it. Uh, Chairman Baucus, of the, of the Senator Baucus, uh, had some single payer advocates thrown out and actually they were arrested for asking why is single payer not even being discussed. Uh, I think he now regrets that, that there was nothing, that nothing there, were, there were no hearings on that so that there at least could be a, uh, uh, some conversation about whether or not it might work in this country, but it was not even that at the congressional level. Uh, I'm not sure where I'm going with this to answer your question to tell you the truth, except that, that uh, uh, the insurance lobby, the drug company lobby, and, and that's just in health care, they are also incredibly entrenched in our power structure and, the, and, and can, can dictate how things are done in Washington, um, that uh, we as, as citizens have very little power as it currently is. We're going to have to figure out how to take our country back, to borrow Sarah Palin's mm. words, I guess. Thank you. Uh, a friend of mine was among the people who helped organize the, the protests in the hearing room uh, yeah. that you just referred to, Senator Baucus. Mm -hmm. um, and it was over, repeatedly people were uh, removed from the yeah. hearing room and arrested um, just for asking the question, can we even discuss a single payer option? Not government run health care as mm -hmm. it's always carefully uh, mischaracterized it's not government-run health care, it's government insurance like we already have. It's called Medicare. Mm. Um, sadly, tonight, on the other, over in Boston at the Harvard Medical School, there's a meeting tonight. They picked tonight to have a meeting to discuss the single-payer uh, option. People from Physicians for a Na National Health Plan are there. Oh, that's where they are. Yeah. I'm really disappointed that I, had to, I chose to be here uh, because of the Thank re you. learning recently about your your, your work. I would like you to amplify a little on what you just began to talk about and be a little more specific about what, I'm not happy with it, but I'd like to hear what your view is of what I think started here in Massachusetts and then became the model for this national, not health care reform, but health insurance reform, mm -hmm. if it even is a reform. Yeah. Um, here you could call it um, Romney care, it, nationally, we could call it Obamacare. I don't, I, 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 neither one is probably terribly accurate. But what does it do? What was it intended to do? And what doesn't it do that really we need to have done? And how is what it doesn't do going to become it, an obstacle to what really needs to be done? I mean, because I think the argument is that not only is it not genuine reform, but it's also in a way, making, making the genuine reform that many people recognize is needed even more, more difficult. Yeah, and I, I will address that by saying this. I was, um, you know, I was among the folks who said just before the Senate was about to vote on its legislation that it should pass. Uh, I was worried that it would collapse. And uh, one chapter in my book is about uh, the fact that it's, for over 100 years, we've tried to do this. And, and I tried to explain just how influential the special interests are in making sure real reform doesn't happen. And this was the closest we've ever come to getting something significant. It's far, far, far from real reform, uh, as I said before. Uh, my worry was that if we didn't at least pass this to get something passed that would bring more people into coverage in ways that you know, I'm not all that happy about, uh, we could at least save a lot of lives. Uh, maybe eventually uh, we won't have to admit that 45,000 of us die every year in this country because we don't have access to coverage. Uh, and I didn't want that any more lives to be you know, in, my, in my hands. Uh, uh, and I was trying to, to tell single-payer folks this as well. A lot of them said this is worse, worse than nothing. I just didn't agree with that because I was so familiar with the power of special interest to make sure that nothing good was going to happen. Uh, the single-payer folks, uh, 
when I started speaking out as an advocate, I had just you know, fairly recently come out of the corporate world. Uh, everything is done very strategically with a lot of resources. Uh, it's very, very sophisticated. Uh, and I don't think that the single payer folks had a clue what they were up against. And they really have not, in my view, uh, developed a strategy for how to communicate to the rest of the country the benefits of single payer. You have to be able to do that, and people need to understand what the benefits are before you're going to get policymakers uh, to, to, to line up behind you. They will not do it. Uh, and and the, so the, 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 the electorate had not been sufficiently informed, uh, and in fact, single payer has been so villainized by the insurance industry over so many years that people believe it's, it would be a, a terribly wrong thing for this country. So it's going to take some time before single-payer advocates can, can really get uh, candidates in large numbers behind the concept. Now, uh, I think this reform will do good. It will make some practices illegal that should have been made illegal. Uh, and that's an important thing to have done, as long as we have to have the system we've got. Uh, and it will bring some people into coverage, so some lives will be saved. I don't think that our, our system is ultimately sustainable even with this reform. I think it ultimately will collapse, because still the insurance company's model is to shift more and more of the cost of care from them and from employers to us. We're paying higher premiums. We're paying more out of our own pocket. This legislation limits that. But it doesn't really do away with this model. And it's just not something. The, the, the median household income in this country is just $50,000. That's a heck of a lot more than the CEO of Cigna made uh, when he walked out the door last November, or last December, with $111 million just as a goodbye, uh, his, his pension and, and you know, his deferred compensation. Uh, those executives were saying uh, for a while until it really became obviously it wasn't a good thing to say, that people needed to have more skin in the game, uh, that we were uh, isolated or insulated from the real cost of health care. So we needed to, to uh, feel more pain, give up more skin, pay more for health care so that we would know how much it really cost. Uh, that's easy to say if you're making $20 million a year. But if you're making $50,000, uh, and that's the median, that means that half the families in this country make less than that. The, the average uh, premium for a family of four that you get through the workplace is now almost $14,000. Some of the policies that these companies are now selling have $30,000 deductibles. And people are paying you know, hard-earned hard money for what is becoming valueless. Uh, we're paying more for less, and that cannot be sustained over the long haul. So what's the core? What's the core of what needs to be done that the current legislation just doesn't tackle? Well, this legislation is 2,700 pages long. It does tackle a heck of a lot more than most people realize. And it's, 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 it's uh, made fun of because it's so big, but we have such a big, large, complex, uh, dysfunctional health care system, it takes a lot to try to fix it. You know, the, 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 the single-payer legislation is just uh, a couple pages long because it's, uh, it is a simple way to get rid of the, the, the way we finance health care system and replace it with something else. That might be ideal. Uh, what do I think? I don't know. I think what we need in this country is something that we've not been able to achieve before. I, I, I wish that we could have people who really are good caregivers, who understand our health care system, who've had some experience with health care systems around the world. If they could come together and shed some baggage, if a CEO for Cigna, for example, could come into this room and just pretend for the time he's here that he's not a CEO, that he's not accountable to Wall Street. If we could bring some people together who, who uh, can think nothing more than the welfare of our folks here and not for the concerns of, of Wall Street or their own self-interest, and I would, I would put doctors in that case too, in that, that category too. Uh, one of the reasons we have such high uh, medical inflation is because doctors and, and hospital executives want to make more money. They want to be more highly compensated themselves. Uh, we've got a system in this country more than any other that is driven by profit and greed in our health care system. So that's got to change, quite frankly, before anything meaningful is going to change. I, 
first, I want to thank you very much for what you've done. Thank you. Um, you know. Thank you very much. Second, as an educator and as an activist, I was very interested in you know what catapulted you to make such a um, deep life change. I'd, I'd like to know the reverse too. That is, you're clearly a thoughtful, kind, very knowledgeable person. What was it, and I'm not asking this in a mean way, I'm asking as an educator, what was it that prevented you for so many years from seeing you know, what you were doing? Because the minute you saw it, yeah, you yeah, acted. It was clear. I was able to, to isolate myself from the real world. Uh, I've sometimes, uh, I didn't tell this part of the story, but uh, a couple of weeks after going back to work at Cigna, uh, I, I often flew in the corporate jet. Uh, and often between Philadelphia and Connecticut, where I used to work and where the healthcare operations are still based. Um, and I would fly on the corporate jet. It was, a, it was always available. Sometimes I would not get on it because there were others who were higher up in the, the pecking order than me. But I flew a lot on the corporate jet. And I was paying attention, finally, uh, uh, as to what was really going on around me that, on that flight. Uh, a flight attendant who worked for the company uh, served the CEO and me at lunch on Gold Rim China gave us uh, gold-plated flatware to eat it with. We were seated in these luxurious leather chairs and uh, you know, polished wood all around us. Uh, and I, I knew how much it cost to operate those, those things, uh, $5,000 an hour just for jet fuel. And, and, and had I not been to Wise County, I probably wouldn't have given it a second thought. But it just occurred to me that a lot of those people were standing in those lines waiting to get care at animal stalls because I needed to fly to Connecticut in a corporate jet. Um, what really happens is that we are so afraid of losing our stuff, uh, to be quite frank. Uh, we, even if I was paid well, uh, there was somebody else who was paid more than me. And you have that to look forward to. In the corporate environment, uh, you want to earn a bonus. You want to get a raise. You want to get a, a, a good rating, uh, better than you got last year and better than your peer got. There's this competitive thing inside a corporation. You become part of it. You become part of that team. You, you strive for your own self-interest. Uh, uh, if you're making $300,000 a year, you still have a mortgage to pay. You still have kids to put in college. You have a lot of expenses. You've bought things that you probably can't afford just because you want to have that lifestyle and a lifestyle even more than you're making. You get trapped, and people get trapped. And you also are in jobs, at least I was. See, I didn't really know a lot that went on until I was higher up in the organization, and I could actually see it. Most folks, to, to someone's point, uh, the, the organization, the, 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 these corporations are controlled by a few people. Most of us are just worker bees, and we go about doing our job, and we think we're doing a good job, and we are doing our, our little piece of it, and uh, uh, we can't see the forest for the trees because we can't see it from, that, from the top of a, a skyscraper where the, where the CEOs, uh, CEOs and the and CFOs sit. Um, and you're able to avoid seeing what I saw in Wise County. Uh, I could, the CEO, for example, and I, again, I don't want to keep picking on the CEO, but it's just kind of typical. Uh, he'd be picked up at his home by a chauffeur, uh, driven to work in a, in a, in a, in a limo, you know, not, a, not a stretch, but a nice sedan. Uh, and uh, he would go to the office, he'd ride up to his office in the elevator, stay there. Uh, I don't think at one time did I ever see the CEO in the, in the cafeteria. Uh, not one time in the cafeteria, unless there was some, some function that he actually had to be down there. Uh, but you never saw him sitting at the table. Uh, your premiums, thank you very much, paid for his lunch. He didn't have to part with any of his dollars to, to buy his own lunch until that had to be reported in the proxy statement. And then the, the company decided that's not very good PR. So they finally started making the, the CEO and his team pay for their own lunch. Uh, but then at the end of the day, the limo driver is there and takes you back home to your nice house in the suburbs or your nice condominium in the city. You can avoid seeing someone who's in need. You can avoid seeing those faces of the people that your company is, is making certain are uninsured. And when you are able to live that life and not see that around you, uh, you can rationalize, you can justify your existence. You don't, you, 
I said earlier, I, I, I dealt in numbers, and you, that's what you do. Uh, you don't associate real people with those numbers. I speak for myself. I'm not speaking for anybody else. That's what happened to me, and I suspect happens to others. And you do begin to rationalize that, you know, those high-profile cases that I mentioned, I felt sometimes that I had made a difference, that uh, the, the company had changed its, its, its ruling or its decision maybe based on, on, on something I had said. Like, you need to understand the PR consequences of going forward with this denial, and sometimes the denial will be reversed. Uh, uh, they would never own up to the fact that it was because of public pressure or f for PR reasons. But I would sometimes think, well, good for me. I helped save someone's life. Uh, or I might be someone who's in care management or disease management, and I, I'm doing something good. Uh, and that's, that is true. Uh, a lot of the, uh, the people I worked with are not evil people. We're just caught up into something that is much bigger than we are and controlled by people uh, who are answerable to Wall Street, and we just can't see it until we're right there in those executive suites. And, and just to add one more thing, what you talked about the media, the media needs to show it, right? Yes, and don't hold your breath. In fact, yesterday morning, I'll just tell this little story. I, you know, I've not been on the Today Show uh, uh, yet. I've not been invited. But... Um, uh, last week uh, on the Amazon ratings, my book was way up there, uh, uh, up to about number 30 or something like that. And my wife noticed that, hey, your book is uh, even higher than the, this uh, Kardashian book. You may have heard of the Kardashian sisters. Well, momentarily, it was a little bit above that. Well, lo and behold, yesterday morning, Matt Lauer on the Today Show, I don't watch that show much anymore because I just can't tolerate it. Uh, but he, was, he had all three of those girls uh, lined up, and he was talking to them uh, about why they wrote this book. And uh, they were holding forth that we wanted to make sure that, that our fans knew the beauty secrets that we used. And I thought, geez, Louise, uh, uh, there's no hope for our society. Uh, and I thought, I'm just going to go back to bed. You know, what's the use here? Uh, but that's, that's what's happened to our, our mainstream media. That's what passes as... as news and information. Sorry, to get off on a tangent there. Well, thanks. That's, uh, I'm not sure if that's a segue to my question or not, but good story. Um, my question is actually an attempt at leaving here with a positive, um, mood, in a positive mood and at least avoiding uh, depression or, I mean, <laughs> I have a good health insurance plan, so it covers depression, so it's okay. Um, <laughs> But it seems to me that special interests are going to continue to exist in this country. I don't think carriers are going to go away. I don't think merged general hospitals are going to go away. I just don't see that happening. And I think the health care reform that we got is probably the best that we can have, given the mood yes. of the election of 2008 and all that. So, so that's, um, and, I, and I also know that there are plenty of criticisms of our health care system, many of which you've made. There are also plenty of criticisms of all other health care yes. systems. You're right. And I wonder if there is something positive about having a private, say, entrepreneurial, well-regulated, um, I realize this is sort of utopian, healthcare system that, that would be a unique contribution, not a copy of what the Canadians are doing or the British, but something that would harness, I don't know, the entrepreneurialism and capitalism to create a better system. Here in Massachusetts, we have pretty good regulations uh, Cigna doesn't operate. They can't because they're cost prohibitive. The local mm -hmm. carriers uh, are, are much more efficient than Cigna. Yeah. So there is a, a, a reason to believe that there's something positive about private entrepreneurialism, perhaps. Yes. Can you give us a positive spin on private health insurance, health care? I can, and I am hopeful. I think that the Cignas of the world will... Um, uh, continue to evolve. When I joined uh, Cigna in 1993, as I said earlier, I think it was a big multi-line insurance company. Uh, they were they were dinosaurs. Uh, Cigna had a property and casualty division. It had a financial services division, a reinsurance division, among others, and healthcare was just one of of several divisions. Wall Street didn't particularly like that after a while because he said, Cigna, you've got to focus on one or two businesses. And the other multi-lines were Aetna and MetLife and Travelers and, uh, you know, there are two or three more. It's just not coming to my mind right now. But uh, uh, 
they all had to change at Wall Street's behest. Uh, they had to focus on one or the other. Cigna and Aetna decided to stay in healthcare. Travelers and, uh, uh, and MetLife uh, and a, a few others sold their healthcare operations to focus on property and casualty and, their, and financial services, for example. I'm saying that because I've seen just in the uh, years that I've worked in the industry and a, a huge change in the way these companies operate. When I joined Humana in 1989, it was largely known as a healthcare uh, hospital company. Um, it had a big managed care division. Uh, eventually, the company, while I was there, decided that it could make more money in managed care than it could operating hospitals. So it spun off the hospitals and became a big managed care company. And it's thrived. Uh, it's made a lot of money. But these, my point is these companies change. They evolve. And if this legislation works as I hope it will, uh, these companies will be regulated in ways that they haven't been before. What they're going to be doing uh, uh, beginning in January, that they're already at it, is to try to strip out some of those regulations so that they will have more free reign, if you will. Uh, but I don't think that's going to, I don't think they can do that. And even if they do, their business models are just simply not sustainable. Here's where I'm going with this. These for-profit companies will soon realize other investors will decide for them, this is not the best place to make a buck. We can take our money elsewhere and more, earn more uh, and get a better return on our investment than we can keep our money in Cigna or Humana or, or these other companies. They're already, these companies, are preparing for uh, a change. Cigna has an international division that its CEO talks about a lot on investor calls, and it has grown quite a bit. It sells uh, health insurance in China. Now, these are supplemental policies. Their uh, cancer insurance is big in China, for example. Uh, and Cigna has a joint venture partner, and it's selling, making a lot of money uh, selling supplemental products there and other parts of the, of the world. Uh, they're going to be changing their business models, and I'm hopeful that the regulations will be such that the profit margins will, str will shrink and that we'll go back to the day when uh, basic health care insurance will be provided by nonprofits, like you have largely here in Massachusetts, that, that are more efficient, and like Kaiser Permanente that's, that operates as a nonprofit, uh, and, and the Blue Cross and Blue Shield. See, what happened is I write in the book to our, 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 the notion of, of true insurance in this country, it was developed, the forerunner of the, the Blue Cross system, uh, it was a, a true community rated system. Uh, it, 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 teachers were among the first to be enrolled in a, in a plan, and they all paid the same amount, regardless of their age or their health status. Uh, and that was a great system, but the big for-profit insurers saw a way to make a buck by offering policies that would attract healthy and younger workers. And so that was the beginning of the end, in my view. Uh, and we've got this system now that is just uh, a, a completely unworkable system. But I'm optimistic. I think that uh, we can get to a way of financing our health care. And you're right. Uh, we can't just adopt a Canadian system and, and, and plant it down here or one in France or Germany or the UK. Uh, but we can learn from what they've done, learn from their mistakes, and learn from what works from all of these. And, uh, and that's why I said if we could really have great minds come into a room and just uh, try to create that without knowing that they had to satisfy Wall Street, uh, then we might get somewhere. Yes, ma'am. Uh, again, thank you so much for the very unique role that you've uh, been able to uh, play in this, this whole health care debate. I'm wondering if you could name one or two practical, concrete suggestions for those of us who don't watch the Today Show and who consider ourselves reasonably aware of yeah. this whole issue. What can we do? Well, just like the, the, the people who are squeaky wills, uh, if they've been wronged by their insurance company, you need to be vocal. You need to make sure that you are writing letters to the editor, that you are calling your insurance commissioner, that you are staying engaged, that you are participating, that you're joining organizations that are fighting for real reform. Uh, that's what we really have to do. One of the things that, that this, these front groups do is they create the perception of grassroots. They're called astroturf organizations. Uh, they're not real. They're not real grassroots. Uh, but they 
policymakers and the public and the media think that that's true. We've got, uh, it, uh, with, with you all here, you can really create real grassroots organizations and, and make a difference. And, and that is the one thing that, I th that gives me hope is that if people wise up and if they start working together, one of the things that the industry uh, has done that has made them so successful, even you know, the insurance industry is not highly regarded and never has had a, a very, uh, it's, it's always been rated just a bit higher than the tobacco companies in, in terms of public esteem. Um, they know that, so they uh, align with uh, other, other organizations like the U.S. Chamber of Commerce and the National Federation of Independence and uh, in, uh, Independent Business uh, to carry their water for them. My point is here, we need to reach out and, and form relationships with other organizations that might at first seem to be strange bedfellows. The insurance industry does. Uh, look at, I've got a, a chapter in the book called The Playbook. Look to see how they're doing it. I'm not suggesting doing anything devious, but we need to start thinking strategically and really be active and stay involved and create the real impression uh, that we are engaged and that we, we're holding our elected officials accountable. Call them, write them, uh, because you can rest assured the, the opposition is organizing these astroturf things to influence the way policy is made. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for uh, what you're doing. Thank you. Uh, my question has to do with, uh, first, we, uh, we pretty well agree, most of us here, that the health care bill we have is probably the best we could have gotten under the circumstances, and that it has some aspects that will do some good. My question is, how worried are you about the new Congress defunding portions of the health care bill? I'm not Starving so, their implementation. Yeah. Rate. Well, there is some danger of that. What I'm really worried most about is uh, the influence of the insurance industry and other special interests to, to influence how the regulations are being written to what is already enacted into law. And this is not being watched by the media. Uh, I, one of the things I am doing is serving as a consumer representative to the National Association of Insurance Commissioners, the NAIC, which the, the Congress gave a lot of responsibility to, to write some of the regulations, like the one that uh, addresses the medical loss ratio. Under this bill, uh, insurers will have to spend at least 80% of every premium dollar on activities that improve care and, and on claims. Uh, that's significant, but the insurance industry doesn't like that at all. Uh, so they will be working uh, with their lobbyists to try to weaken that regulation, to try to get the Department of Health and Human Services to grant lots of waivers so that it eventually becomes relatively meaningless. So uh, I'm more, more worried about uh, what might happen in the implementation of what we've got. But you're right, with the Republicans uh, taking control of the House, there's a, a risk that what's been done will be undone, or big chunks of it. I'm worried primarily that the consumer protections will be stripped out or, or weakened. I don't think it will be repealed, uh, despite the fact that a lot of Republicans campaigned on that. And you'll see a big show. You'll see, and, and very possibly, the House may pass a bill to repeal it. Uh, uh, and they, they will do that uh, even though the health insurance industry does not want it repealed. They'll, the health insurance lobbyists will have a little talk with them, kind of a come to Jesus meeting, and they'll say, look, we helped get you here. We don't want this repealed because we like the fact that this makes people buy our product. Uh, that'll give us a new lease on life and billions of dollars in new revenue for quite a long time to come. So get with the program, guys. Uh, we'll keep contributing to your campaign and not to your opponents as long as you play the game the way we want it to be played. Go ahead. You can go ahead and pass this bill because we don't think it'll pass the Senate, and even if it does, the president's going to veto it. So do what you got to do to satisfy the base. If I'm sounding cynical, I'm just telling you the way it really is. Uh, I, I, I saw this from the days I was a reporter, but that's just the way things are done. I'm not sure where I'm going with this except to say that uh, uh, there is danger that the bill can be weakened. Uh, some, of it, some of it might be defunded, but uh, it's a very complexly uh, structured bill that uh, if you un pull the string, uh, a lot of it will unravel and uh, the insurance companies won't like that either. They're worried about this as much as uh, consumers are, that uh, this could really cause a, a real chaos. They, this legislation props them up. It gives them a, 
it gives them a, a few more years, and it also props up the employer-based system, which big business likes.